I'll introduce Lou Rockwell, our founder, who started the Mises Institute with, with Ron Paul's help, with Murray Rothbard's help, with the help of Margaret von Mises in the early 1980s. And he's, he's uh, really seen the organization grow. And I know that it means a lot to him to see uh, this kind of turnout. So Dr. <coughs> so, Dr. Paul, thank you so much, and Lou Rockwell. Today's event is all about looking ahead and what awaits us in 2016 and beyond. We have plenty to be concerned about, to be sure. The usual bad guys are up to their usual wickedness. At the same time, we're living through some extremely positive changes, and I'd like to discuss several of them today. These changes have occurred so quickly, and I suspect few of us have fully absorbed their true significance. If we had, we might have a much more confident view of the future than many of us do today. One of them is obvious and has been happening for some time, living standards. Whether it's child mortality, caloric intake, living space, environmental quality, life expectancy, real income, or many other contributions to human well-being, the movement has not only been up, but dramatically so. Now, our material standard of living is in everything, but it sure is something. Consider these facts in the England of the late, just the late 19th century. The differences between rich and poor were evident not only in income, but also in such metrics as life expectancy and even height. The rich lived 17 years longer than the poor and were a full five inches taller. Today, the discrepancy has been reduced to two years and less than a single inch. In the United States, material progress has been so great that the incomes of the average poor household in the year 2000 would have placed it in the top 5 or 10% of all households in 1900. If you think there hasn't been progress even over the past generation or so, ask yourself if you'd like to go back to 1977 and the manual typewriter, those gigantic heavy televisions with three channels, cars without air conditioning, not to mention no internet, no instant communication with anyone anywhere in the world, and no access to the great literary and scholarly achievements of mankind at the push of a button. This explosion in material wealth and the standard of living had its origin in the Industrial Revolution, a period and a phenomena portrayed in most government classrooms as a terrible catastrophe for the working class. The state's preferred narrative is obvious enough. Without state intervention, the condition of the average person is bound to deteriorate. A scholarly discussion among historians of that period has become known as the standard of living debate, and it took in the later half of the uh, last half of the 20th century. Largely unbeknownst to the general public, the so-called optimists, the people who believed the Industrial Revolution had raised the standard of living, yes, there are people who don't, <laughs> don't believe that, were the clear winners. The only debate that still takes place today involves pinpointing exactly when the improvement in living standards began, <clears throat> not whether it occurred. <clears throat> Excuse me. The extent of mankind's material progress, and especially that of the poorest, has been astonishing. And much of it occurred long before the creation of modern welfare states, in case the state wanted to try to take credit for it, which of course it does. We live much better than people have ever lived. And liberation from destitution has allowed us to pursue on a much greater scale than ever before, pursuits that we find intellectually and spiritually fulfilling pursuits that have been impossible and unthinkable to those who came before us. <clears throat> so that's an obvious one. Obvious in the facts, obvious in the implications, human beings continue to live better and better despite all the best efforts of the state. Here's a more subtle one. As long as liberty has fought against power, it has been at a decided disadvantage. In one way or another, the state has dominated the molding of opinion. This is an essential state activity because it is the way that the population is indoctrinated into the need for, and consequently made amenable to, the exercise of state power. Here's how Murray and Rothbard describe our situation. Quote, in past centuries, the church has constituted the exclusive opinion molding classes in society. Hence the importance to the state and its rulers of an established church, and the importance to libertarians of the concept of separating church and state, which really means not allowing the state to confer upon one group a monopoly of the opinion molding function. 
In the 20th century, the church was replaced in its opinion molding rule, or in that lovely phrase, the engineering of consent, by a swarm of intellectuals, academics, social scientists, technocrats, policy scientists, social workers, journalists, and the media generally, and on and on. Often included for old time's sake, so to speak, is a sprinkling of social gospel ministers and counselors from mainstream churches. So to sum up, the problem is that the bad guys, the ruling classes have gathered unto themselves, the intellectual and media elites who are able to bamboozle the masses into consenting to their rule, to indoctrinate them, as the Marxists would say, with false consciousness, unquote. More than anything else, this has been the problem that has faced libertarians, libertarianism since it first began to emerge as a distinct school of thought. What we stand for runs directly contrary to the interests of power, and it is power that dominates the opinion molding function, first in the schools, then in the media. That means people do not get exposed to our ideas, except perhaps in caricature. In the schools, our ideas have been ignored. In the media, they have gone from being ignored, always the media's preferred strategy when our numbers were so much smaller, to being distorted and demonized. I always get a laugh out of the conservatives who say, the, the, the dissemination of propaganda in public schools is a recent phenomenon. If only the schools hadn't strayed from their noble pursuit of the truth. Well, sure, as fact, as Murray Rothbard pointed out in his little book, Education Free and Compulsory, the purpose of government-run schooling from the very beginning was to indoctrinate the students into a set of, of established beliefs in order to bolster the priorities of established authority. The homeschooling movement attacks this root and branch. It is one of the most significant social phenomena of our times. In almost no time, it became so large that even the state couldn't abolish it. With millions of people withdrawing from the state's primary apparatus of opinion molding, what remains for these people was to be sure that they themselves were teaching some th uh, things that were sound and reliable and not partially still in thrall to the state propaganda. Ron Paul's new homeschooling curriculum helps solve this very problem. Students won't go through a dozen years of formal education without ever hearing the names Mises, Bastia, Rothbard. They'll realize there's another side to the state's threadbare story. At the click of a mouse, the entire curriculum is available to any family anywhere in the world. Likewise, Khan Academy teaches mathematics from the most elementary to the most advanced concepts in a large series of amazing free online videos. It's ventured into other areas, but really math is its strength. Millions of kids use it. The very existence of resources like this, and there are more of them than you can believe, can help but raise the question, if kids can get a top-notch education for little or nothing, why are we paying such humongous property taxes every year? At the university level, 2015 was a very, very bad uh, year for their public relations. On one campus after another, horrified parents discovered that if anything, left-wing hysteria and intimidation were far worse than any of them had realized before now. Institutions were shut down over bizarre, absurd, and even impossible demands. The demands themselves were outgrowths of campus incidents that student activists insisted were evidence of systemic racism but which on closer exa examination turned out to be exceedingly mild, actually benign, or often made up out of whole cloth. As usual, the diversity ideologues have no interest in diversity at all and take for granted that everyone should be herded into the conventional four-year ordeal. But what if different people could choose the educational paths that suited them? We're beginning to see this already with places like Hack Reactor, whose 12-week intensive course of study yields programmers who are in high demand, they have a 99% hiring rate, and their graduates earn an average starting salary of $105,000 a year. Or how about this? Could they be at Google University someday? Now, a Google University will teach mainstream views, to be sure, but it will acclimatize the American people more and more to the creation of educational materials, curriculum, and delivery mechanisms by institutions other than the state. And as Gary North wonders, if there's a Google University, 
went out of Google High School and on down through the grade levels. The university itself is a dinosaur, propped up by social inertia and government subsidy. The last thing we should want is to make it free. Any professor can tell you that the majority, sometimes the great majority of college students, have little aptitude for academic pursuits and even less intellectual curiosity. Diverting still more people onto this path is socially undesirable and economically wasteful to a disastrous degree. The Mises Institute, on the other hand, is a microcosm of the university system of the future. Scholarly, high-tech, and cheap. With technology pushing the price of instruction dramatically lower, what reason will there be to, in the future to shell out perhaps upwards of $60,000 a year for the privilege of being intimidated and propagandized? Just as significant in terms of opinion molding and the state's crumbling monopoly are the blows suffered by the traditional media, particularly in its print form. None of us could have expected to be living in a world in which the New York Times and the Washington Post are losing money, which is a very neat thing to see. Both are shrinking. The Times has even floated the idea that someday there may, may no, be no more printed New York Times at all. What a talk about a great dream. <laughs> The numbers for print newspapers, in fact, are even worse than you might think. Just in the two-year period from 2013 to 2015 saw catastrophic losses in subscribers. Wall Street Journal's numbers fell from 1.5 million to less than 1.1 million. The New York Times went from 731,000 to 528,000. The Washington Post, it's declined from 431,000 to 330,000. The numbers for USA Today are truly horrific from 1.4 million to less than 300,000, or maybe not so horrific. <laughs> this is extremely bad news for the establishment media. Meanwhile, alternative news and commentary sources continue to grow and flourish. The establishment is helpless to do anything about it. During the various run-ups to war with Iran, for example, the world was able to find out the real truth about the war makers' claims thanks to a variety of news sources which most people now have access to. More extraordinary still were the YouTube videos created by Westerners who traveled to Iran, explored the country, and spoke to its people. Instead of the alien culture full of scary, angry people who wanted to kill us all, they found normal people, normal families, normal businesses, and people who loved the people of the West, even if they didn't think much of its governments. Smart Iranians. When in the history of the world has anything so gloriously subversive been possible? And if it wasn't Westerners trying to convey the truth about the Iranian people, it was ordinary Israelis and Iranians exchanging messages of peace. Everyone knows, knew that politicians were hopeless, so they appealed directly to each other, conveying unforgettable sentiments of goodwill. The American media's traditional function has been to limit the extent of permissible debate and to promote the regime's official narrative about current events. Even when the media appears to oppose the state, as say with Watergate, this is only an illusion. Richard Nixon's journalistic critics were concerned that the 37th president's enormities had tarnished the presidency. Of course, that's Nixon's great legacy. So whenever you attempted to become discouraged, remember that the state's monopoly and the opinion molding function is weaker and more vulnerable than it has ever been. This is a development few could have predicted. In identifying these important and favorable trends, I do not wish to be misunderstood. I'm not suggesting that victory is already within our grasp or that we're, also, we're not also not witnessing some truly horrific trends and developments. I know the horrors all too well, as do you. But the struggle for liberty, which has existed since the beginning of time, is likely to carry on until its very end. What I am saying is this, we should not permit our present travails to blind us to the momentous changes through which we are living and whose consequences are so potentially far-reaching that even now we can't predict their future. But with the state's monopoly on opinion dissemination crumbling year by year, it's hard to believe the future of the cause of liberty isn't brighter than it has ever been in our lifetimes. In fact, when people say the situation is hopeless, I think back to what life was like during Murray's life 
which wasn't all that long ago. Not only was the libertarian movement, if we could even call it that, vanishingly small, but the prospects for its growth were virtually nil. With a hostile media completely dominant in the opinion molding field, libertarians faced an extremely slow and uphill battle. That never bothered Murray, of course, who relished the struggle and did the right thing, whatever the obstacles. But the chances you must have thought of as ever reaching millions of people, essentially zero. Or I think back to the early days of the Mises Institute. If someone wanted an article we'd written, he'd have to call or write us. We had to photocopy the article, put it in an envelope, put a government stamp on it, put it in the government mail, and send it to him. By today's standards, that seems hopeless. Today, not only can anyone in the whole world easily browse our entire collection of tens of thousands of articles, not to mention books, courses, and videos, but you can also share any of our materials in an instant. And indeed, people can do and can and do stumble on our material quite by accident. Unlike our inquirer who called us about an article, any computer user anywhere in the world can come across something we've produced, whether in the course of his own research or discovering us through a social media post or having it sent to him by a friend. And as I'll bet many people in this very room can attest, that one article, video, or book is often the door that leads someone irreversibly down the path to Austrian economics and libertarianism. As the state's opinion molding monopoly collapses, the Mises Institute is poised to play a more significant role than ever, but with our speakers, our scholars, our YouTube channel, our events, our vast media collection, and our educational programs for students. The brightest lights of libertarianism today came through our programs as students or were taught by those who did. There is no organization anywhere that has been more steadfast in principle and more tireless in transmitting our ideas to future generations. We cannot do what we do without your help, of course. Please join us as supporters of the Mises Institute. Together, let's work to make the, sure that the old world that we hope is passing away before our eyes, a world of lies, propaganda, central planning, and war can be replaced by another form, without, not another form of central planning, but by a world of peace, liberty, truth, and prosperity. Thank you.